Ana Wasalan, this is our Middle East, Al Shak Al Asadlana Man, together. Jews and Arabs, Kurds, Muslims, Christians, Alawites, all of us indigenous to this ancient, complex, and colorful Middle East. Today, Susan Kitaz, an Iraqi Kurdish commentator and journalist, she's seen it all. And she said, We're brothers and sisters in arms, Jews and Kurds, Israelis and Kurds, seeking independence, identity, recognition in this very complex region. Join us. Hello, Salam. How are you? Salam, Shalom from Jerusalem, Yerushalayim. Uh, this is a very uh, special edition of our Middle East, which we're going to say in Arabic. Uh, there we go. It's our Middle East, meaning the Middle East of Kurds and Israelis, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Arabs, Shia, Sunnah, Baluchis, Turkmen, all of us in our Middle East in the broadest possible sense. It's um, this. This is a show about brothers and sisters in arms, Jews and Kurds, Israelis and Kurds. A long history in this Middle East, and I'm so delighted to have you, uh, Suzanne Kutaz, a Iraqi Kurd, uh, also uh, with roots in in uh, the United Kingdom, but uh, very much a uh, a woman of the region. And uh, this region is very much about Kurdish-Israeli relations as well. Two minority cultures, the Jews and the Kurds, I mean, going back uh, centuries, both of us. And both Jews and Kurds have been struggling for their own independence and freedom for years. And in fact, we have been brothers and sisters in arms because as we were talking just before we went on the air, that when in, in 1917, when the uh, British Balfour Declaration uh, was announced, it was the, the Zionist leadership that was exclusively and uniquely publicly uh, backing Kurdish independence. And as you and I know, the Kurds have been struggling for independence across the Middle East, from Turkey to Syria, to the Kurdish, popu to the Kurdish community in Iraq, where you have basically de facto sovereignty anyway in the, uh, in the autonomous area in, in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, and also in Iran. So you've got four countries with major uh, Kurdish populations, and um, the most successful uh, sovereign experiment, if you will, has been Iraqi Kurdistan. But it is very much, as we said in the opening of the show, it's uh, al shak al Asad lana kulana, all of us. And uh, so it's great to have you. Uh, it's great to have you with us. You're in Israel now for yes. a special conference. Yes, yeah. So um, on Monday, I attended a tech conference, uh, and they were talking about you know the um, the regional changes, you know, uh, about how uh, the Middle East is becoming smaller and smaller, like we're all one nation. And uh, it was about you know the startup nation, about real estate. And uh, one of the things that really made me uh, made me really impressed is I saw an Iraqi, two actually two Iraqi businessmen, and uh, he works as a CEO for a hydro oil company. Uh, the head office in in the United Kingdom, but they have offices in Basra and they have offices in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. And this gentleman was talking about how much Iraqis are welcoming to have normalization with Israel. And for me and, you know, the people who attended the conference, we were all like shocked. Like You're shocked because yes. in 2020, because in 2017, yeah. it was it, it was against Iraqi law to for uh, for Iraqi Kurds to wave Israeli flags. Exactly. In prison. And in 2021, even worse. What happened in 2021? Yeah. So in 2021, uh, the Iraqi government, they start drafting a new law, which make uh illegal uh, to have any uh, any ties with Israeli, uh, be it, you know, like on a social media or Israeli company or the Israeli government. So it's an anti-normalization law and any Iraqi would be threatened with the death penalty. Death penalty yes. for normalization with the Jews, yes. the Israeli. Yes. And it applies to all Iraqi. And all yet, and yet Suzanne Kutaz, an, an Iraqi Kurd, is in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and Tel Aviv 
uh, at a conference about Iraqi Israeli normalization. Yes. Something very strange is going on in this new Middle East. Is it, it is, not? yes. So I would say, you know, this law is uh, was dictated or ordered by the Iranian government uh, and forced on the on the Iraqi parliament. I could confidently say to you that the majority of Iraqis, they do not support this law. And one of the evidence, I mean, I live in London. Um, when I come to Israel, I post, you know, like images and video I have done. I have family who still live in, even in Baghdad. And they will comment and say, lucky you, lucky you, look at this and look at this. People don't care. And the reason why they don't, they don't care, because they've been brainwashed for decades that Israel is the enemy. They know Israel is not the enemy. I mean, what have Israel done to Iraq? I mean, sincerely, seriously. Well, there was that moment in 1981 where Israel bombed mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein's nuclear reactor in Osirak. Yeah, and thank God they did it. Thank God. I mean, the butcher of Baghdad or the butcher of Iraq, he killed so many Iraqi Muslims, uh, you know, Kurds, Arab, Shia, everyone. I mean, imagine if this guy even had a, like, you know, nuclear, what would he, he be capable to, you know? So I'm very happy. And I know many Iraqis, certainly my family, they are very grateful that Israel attacked his nuclear facility in 1982. You know, as an, as an Iraqi Kurd, uh, we we would welcome normalization with Israel. I mean, back in 2009, uh, there was a big pool conducted in Iraqi Kurdistan and more than 71% of Kurds welcome a normalization, you know, with, with Israel. Uh, our um, um, former president, Jalal Talabani, in 2005, he openly, he openly, you know, called for normalization with Israel. Uh, and again, you always had, you know, like Kurdish leaders saying, we want to have ties with Israel. I mean, in 2008, uh, we had uh, Masoud al-Barzani uh, hugging, uh, embracing the former defense ministry, Ehud Barak. Ehud Barak. Ehud Barak in 2008. And Ariel Sharon yes. uh, uh, reportedly made a trip to yes. Kurdistan. Yeah. And the, I mean, there were protests in Arab media. They were saying, how could you do this? I mean, how could you embarrass a Zionist? And he said, I have done it in my capacity as a Kurd. Why, why have the... Uh, Sunni Arab establishment accused the Iraqi Kurds of being Zionists, of being the, the Jews, the Zionists, right? They publicly called yeah. you the Zionists. Yeah, but this is goes back to like, you know, decades, decades, decades. I mean, back in 1966, uh, the Iraqi defense minister, he said that uh, the Kurds want to create the new Yehudistan, which means, you know, the land of the Jews. And uh, my entire life, you know, as a um, personal, I guess, Suzanne, as a journalist, I had to battle with this. Or uh, if you say anything positive about Israel, people would say to you, and I'm not saying, you know, like a person from the average, like, you know, even journalists would say to me, of course, because you are Kurd, you will always support Israel. So this label, um, you know, we get it assigned at birth that Kurds are supportive of Israel, you know. Uh, and there is a truth in it because Kurds and Jews, uh, sadly, they have a long history of, you know, like, you know, immense suffering. Um, and I think this is what brought them together. I mean, both Kurds and Jews, they are indigenous to this region and both denied, you know, by, by many, I wouldn't say Arabs, I would say Islamists, because I personally think a lot of Arabs, they don't have anything against, you know, the Jews or, or the Kurds, but it's the Islamists and the Islamists' is the propaganda and the narrative that feed into uh, to the crowd. Um, what was I saying? Do you think that the, the new democratization of media, and you're a journalist, mm -hmm. you've worked for Al Jazeera, you've worked yeah. with some of the big mm -hmm. Arab uh, uh, media mm -hmm. outlets, do you think there's a new opportunity for truthful, real uh, reporting and uh, information flow because of the um, social network development, even though there are a lot of mm -hmm. dangers involved also? Uh, definitely. So I work for both Qatari media and Saudi media. And I could tell you that the Saudi media were very different. You know, as a journalist, I was allowed to come to Israel, you know, to uh, to to share my opinion, to interview Israelis, you know, to, to allow Israeli to have the narratives, to have the right to have their voice heard. Uh, with the Qatari media, it was different. It was, I would say, it was more hostile. 
and they wanted to impose a certain narrative. Because this Muslim bro- it's Muslim brother yes. at the end of the day. Yeah. But with the Saudi, I as a journalist, I mean, I felt very, very comfortable. You know, I done some amazing report to show the reality, what Israel is really about. So uh, definitely we're seeing a change. We're seeing a huge change. It looks like um, His Excellency Mohammed bin Salman, 37, 38 mm-hmm. years old, is seeking to radically change the Middle East um, in the image of a startup nation, making mm-hmm. it a startup region. Yes. Uh, looking at Israel uh, with some appreciation and 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 with his own forward-looking vision, mm-hmm. um, really transforming the Middle East. Do you do you see it that way? Yes, definitely. And you know, he's a realist. He's a realist, and he want to take Saudi. You know, change Saudi, transform Saudi. He want to give the young people a chance, and he's extremely popular with the young people. He want to open up, uh, open up. You know, the country. Uh, before his arrival, I mean, Saudi was a bit uh, closed, you know, um, they didn't have a lot of tourism, but now now things are changing. And I'm very confident that Ibn Salman, his first priority is Saudi, you know, Saudi and the Saudis. And, and that priority means that eventually he will normalize ties with Israel because it will be a relationship, win-win relationship for, for both the Saudis and the Israeli and to the region uh, as whole. Do you feel that the Kurds um, have new opportunities now because of a, a region that you and I have talked mm-hmm. about uh, that is given to its younger people, mm-hmm. its young leadership? And on the way over to the podcast in the car, we were talking about how young Iraqis, young Saudis, young Gulfies are, uh, even young Palestinians, mm-hmm. frankly, mm-hmm. in their late 20s, early 30s, they are shedding the propaganda of the past mm-hmm. and embracing new narratives about innovation and technology and shared knowledge and AI uh, and and other you know issues that are very sort of cutting edge. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. With the young people, I mean, like if we go back 30, 40 years ago, it was much more hostile, even 10 years ago. Uh, but with, you know, with the opening up, you know, with the social media, the young people, they, they could see, you know, they, they're not controlled anymore. You know, you have the space, you go on Facebook, you go on Twitter, you go on Instagram and you want to know um, someone who's young, they want to have career opportunity. They want to have a chance to see the world, you know, and a lot of young people, I'm not saying like, you know, they don't believe in Palestine because we have hashtags saying, uh, Palestine leisat qadiyati, which means Palestine is not my cause. They're not saying they're abandoning the Palestinian cause. What they are saying, you know, there could have been a Palestinian state if the Palestinian leadership was genuinely interested in peace. So, you know, people people in their region, especially the young people, they want to live, they want to enjoy life, they want to have, you know, financial um, prosperity. So definitely it's changing, especially with the youth from the Gulf region. You know what's interesting, uh, Suzanne, is that the West and and the Arab mm. East are looking at the region in completely different terms. Mm. The West is still obsessed with the Palestinian issue mm-hmm. uh, in a way that really um, defies logic. Yes. Where what you've said today, I've heard having just come back from Bahrain and the Emirates, and I've heard it from Saudi commentators as well, is that the Palestinians, have the leadership, mm-hmm. has never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity, mm-hmm. to quote our former foreign minister, uh, Abba Evan. Yeah. And it, it really is is true. The, the region is moving away mm-hmm. from the Palestinians, and the West is still frozen mm-hmm. in, on the issue of the Palestinians. I mean, they, they seem to completely misunderstand what's going on in the region. Yeah, it's like because they're sitting outside, you know, they're not inside, you know, if they were more inside in, I would call it the Middle East family, they would have a better understanding, you know, a better understanding. Uh, And when it comes to the Palestinian leadership, I mean, how many more opportunities? I mean, I am so confident, I am so confident if that leadership was genuinely interested to serve and help the Palestinian people, we would have a Palestinian state long, long time ago long time ago and um this is this is my opinion about it what what about the uh the united states led western alliance view of the kurds and iraq there has been this 
uh, narrative mm -hmm. that the United States has promoted of the the integrity mm -hmm. of of the Iraqi territory. It almost sounds like they're talking about the United States as federal mm -hmm. republic. On the it, it, to be fair, Iraq is a type of is a federal mm -hmm. system. You know, you've got mm -hmm. the Shiites in the south and the Sunnis in the center. You've got the Iranian regime <laughs> controlling. Uh, most of Iraq, except for Iraqi Kurdistan in the north, and you have, of course, Iraqi Kurdistan Autonomous Area in the north. What does the United States and the West and the Western powers misunderstand about Iraq and about the Kurds um, as part of this very complex fabric of mm -hmm. the called the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, they keep talking about that. If uh, that uh, the territorial integrity of Iraq is very important, that if you would divide Iraq to like three separate nation like you know Sunni, Shia and Kurds it will create more problem more problem. But what they're doing actually by not doing anything, they creating more problem. If you ask any Iraqi, 90% of Iraqis, and I'm talking about Iraqi Arabs, especially Sunni, they would say to you, the American handed Iraq uh, to Iran in a in a golden plate. Which is true. You know, which is true. Uh, the Sunni Iraqis are not happy what's going on. So I don't understand why why the American, uh, especially the Biden administration, I mean, you know, insisting about this uh, this um, artificial artificial territorial integrity? Because what more do you need? I mean, in 2017, 93% of Kurds voted to be separated from Iraq. Uh, what about, you know, these people and their freedom and their right to, you know, to self-govern, to have their own nation state? And what surprised me with the West, Western countries, I mean, they supported Kosovo, the independent. Why you'd not... 2008. Yes. You know, what about the Kurds? You know, but I blame, I blame the Kurdish leadership. They had the perfect opportunity to 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 declare independent when uh, the region was uh, battling with ISIS. You know, they, I mean, more than 10,000 Kurdish Peshmerga, they gave their life, you know, in their battle to, to eradicate ISIS. That would have been the perfect opportunity to have some le leverage on the West and the American. You know, I help you. I scratch your back. You so scratch my back. how do you explain that the the uh, Iraqi Kurd, the, mm -hmm. especially the Iraqi mm -hmm. Kurdish leadership, failed to take the additional step? I think uh, they said it wasn't ready because they were at state of war. They wanted to get rid of ISIS and then, you know, ask for uh, their demand, which is totally wrong, which is totally wrong. You know, if we go back like to 1948, when uh, David Ben-Gurion uh, declared the state of Israel, the majority of, of Jews, you know, in, in Israel and around the world, they supported this move. The problem with Kurd, there is no unity. There is no unity. You know, you have the people uh, on the street, they want something, and then you have the leadership who wants something else. And my dream is one day we will have, uh, you know, we would have... Uh, that moment, you know, that that you stand as a Kurdish leader and say, I'm declarely, declaring Kurdistan as independent. And then you take the consequences, you know, to be brave like Ben Gurion was in 1948. When you say Kurdish independence, do you mean only for northern Iraq or do you mean across the Middle East in Iran and in Syria and in Turkey as well? Yeah. So, I mean, I have to be realistic. My dream, of course, is to have a greater Kurdistan, to, un to unite all the Kurds. But we have to, you know, start step by step. It's a very hostile region. It's a region where, where, where you know, like the Sunni, the, the Muslims, the Arab, they want to dictate the rule of the game. So uh, I would say we start with the, with, you know, the Iraqi Kurdistan, or what we call it Basur in Kurdish. And then, uh, you know, we move. How is the relationship between Kurds, uh, Shia, and Sunni, according to you know these the, the four countries that Kurds find themselves? I'm I'm we're seeing that even Bashar Assad mm -hmm. looks to the Kurds for stability, for uh, some type of alliance and defense mm -hmm. in, in his uh, very complicated reality right now in Syria. Yeah, because when the uprising in Syria started, uh, the Kurds didn't take part in it. And one of the reasons the Kurds didn't take part in it, because, uh, you know, Kurds in Syria, they have faced immense suffering. You know, people don't talk about that anymore because they talk about the great suffering Kurds suffered under Saddam Hussein. 
But, you know, the Syrian regime under uh, Hafez al-Assad, it was equally as brutal as the Saddam. So the Kurds stepped aside. You know, when the uprising happened, they didn't want to take part. And they built themselves, you know, like step by step. And they created another, like why I would call it a mini Kurdistan. They didn't bother the, the regime. They didn't fight the regime. And I think Bashar al-Assad saw them, I wouldn't say as an equal partner, but definitely he didn't see them as a troublemakers. So, uh, and they have, you know, they have the opportunity to, uh, to, you know, to have the same project we have in Iraqi Kurdistan, but we have the problem with the Turks. Uh, the Turks see you as terrorists. Yes. Yeah, is, the that, is that the same way that the Soviets and the Russians call anyone they consider an enemy, they call them a Nazi? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, the Turks, uh, they see the Kurdish movement as a terrorist. I mean, uh. Uh, they have the good relationship or okay relationship with the Kurds in Iraq, and well, why do why did it, why does uh, Erdogan feel so threatened by the Kurds in Turkey? I mean, the Kurds have never declared that Turkey mm -hmm. should be Kurdistan. Yeah, but you know, Erdogan. I mean, Erdogan is an Islamist. I mean, his roots are Muslim Brotherhood, and with Islamists, they they have a specific mindset. You know, you have to join the majority. If you are a minority, your identity has to be expressed. And Kurds in Turkey, I mean, for decades, they were denied to speak Kurdish. And a lot of Turk would see them as uh, Turks who have forgotten their mother tongue, meaning Turkish. And we are talking about a, like a big, um, big number. It's about uh, 19 million, you know, 19 in Turkey. Uh, in Turkey. Out of, what, 80, out of yeah, 70, 70, 70 something, yeah. yes. So uh, the biggest chunk of Kurds' uh, population is actually in Turkey. It's actually in Turkey. And, and when you look at Kurdistan, you know, and we go back to Israel, uh, like how the Kurds view, um, view Israel, you will see that the Kurds of Iraq, the Kurds of Syria, and the Kurds of uh, Iran, they're more positive to Israel because they have the same enemy, you know. It's... Uh, it's the Arab or the, you know, the Arabs of Syria. I'm talking about the regime. I'm not talking about the people. Because I don't think Israel, if you Arabs or if you, if you Syrians or Iraqi as, as enemy, no. We're talking here about the regime, you know. Israel has nothing to do with the Syrians. And the problem is with the regime. So um, Kurds in these three parts, they share the same enemy Israel share, you know, like the Iranians, the, the, um, the fascist Arab Islamists. While in Turkey, it's the opposite because Turkey has, you know, diplomatic relationship with Israel since what, 1950. So you have a bit of negative view like Turkish Kurd or Kurds in Turkey because they look at Israel and they say, well, Israel is a friend of Turkey. And, uh, you know, so it's a bit, uh, I don't know, it's a bit complex, a bit complex. You have a special... Uh feeling for Israel. I've seen it. We've, we've mm -hmm. met numerous times. We've met in Israel. We've met in London. Hopefully, inshallah, we'll meet in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. Inshallah. Inshallah. Um, what is special about Israel for you personally? Um, so now I was brought up in Europe. I lived my entire life in Europe. You know, Sweden is my home. But when I walk in Sweden, everybody still see me as a foreigner. And honestly, with all honesty, in Israel, when I come to Israel, I feel I'm at home. You know, people don't judge me. Uh, I am myself. It's, uh, and it's culturally, it's very close to my culture. You know, the language, the food, the music, everything, everything about it. And being a Kurd and suffering, you know, immensely, my, our identity was denied. I feel why it's important to have um, a nation, how, you know, to have a home for the Jewish people, you know, to be free, to be able to speak Hebrew, to be able to be yourself, you know, without being attacked, without being discriminated. Uh, so I don't know what I'm trying to say to you. So when the, um, the Iraqi um, uh, defense minister back in 1966 said, uh, oh, Kurds, uh, Kurds, um, want to create, you know, Yehudistan or he talking about, you know, the second Israel. I actually see Israel as my second home, as my second home. Um, as a child, I didn't live in Kurdistan. Uh, my family was deported. And in 2010, I was the first person in my family to visit the Kurdish region. And when I stepped out from the airport and I could see Kurdish flags, you know, the music, people were, were free to express their identity. 
I was so emotional, you know, about it. So, and when I came to Israel and I think it was 2015, the first time, I then, you know, could feel how a Jew would feel when he came, when he come for first time to Israel, you know, to be free, you know, to be free from, uh, you know, people looking at you differently or people denying you, you know, to express your identity, your feeling, your religion. Do you, do you understand what I mean? That, I, 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 yeah. I understand completely. And in fact, and not only do I understand it, it makes the enemies and the adversaries of Israel very much by definition, the adversaries of the Kurds, even in the West. Now, you worked in English for Al Jazeera, which is a Muslim Brotherhood paper and uh, um, uh, 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 network. And in fact, they are um, advancing some of the most uh, cruel propaganda Israel as Nazi, mm. Israel as, as apartheid. How, how do you, how, what was your personal experience in working for Al Jazeera? Did you, did you, did you experience the propaganda yourself? Um, I did. So I worked for Qatari channels. I worked for Al Arabi. I was employed by them directly. And for Al Jazeera, I did the freelance work. And my problem with the journalists in general who work for these channels, especially Qatari channels, they so close-minded, you know, they are learned to hate, you know, learn to hate. And it's very difficult because I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying that Israel is perfect. No, what I'm saying is give the is give Israel the right, you know, to speak for itself, you know, and that will annoy me. Sometimes they want to, they cover Israeli politics and they would bring someone who's not even an Israeli. And this person would, would, would basically pour out loads of poisonous hatred or they would show the worst you know, the worst of Israel. And in, so um, it was difficult. It was really, really, really tough. Um, so um, when the Gaza war happened, the one, the last one. Uh, 21. Uh, 21. Uh, I was asked by a production company. Uh, so they were uh, doing a documentary for Al Jazeera. And this uh, production company, they approached me and they said, we want the Israeli army's narrative. And I brought, you know, this guy, he's a commander who worked for the Israeli army. And he was talking about the length the Israeli army goes to before conducting an attack, you know, uh, warn the residents, you know, uh, so they could, you know, run to safety. And this Al Jazeera director, he was laughing. He said to me, could you believe it? Could you believe it? This guy, uh, this guy is crying for Gaza and you want me to believe it, you know? And the, sis the, the brother of this director, uh, a few weeks later, there was a terrorist attack in uh, Beni Brak. Am I saying yeah. it right? Beni Brak, yeah. Yeah. He actually was glorifying it on social media. So it's funny. The word in Arabic for media mm. is alam. Yes. Which alam. is the same word for public yeah. relations. Yes, yeah. Right? So so the idea about mm. objective mm -hmm. uh, reporting is uh, supposed to be probably more of a Western idea. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, I could give you an example of a colleague of mine, and this colleague is a, is a very senior. I'm afraid I can't say his name. So this guy has worked like for Al Arabi, he works for the BBC, he worked for Al Jazeera. And I have known him for a year, and I kept saying to him, why don't you go to Israel? Go and see it with your own eyes. You know, you don't have to listen to me. Because he would say to me, ah, come on, you're just doing propaganda for Israel. And I said, no, I'm not doing propaganda for Israel. Go and see it with your own eyes. And this guy, he decided to come to Israel this year. And believe me, Dan, I still have his messages on my Facebook Messenger. And he wrote to me, Suzanne, it was an eye-opener. And I said to him, what do you mean it's an eye-opener? He said, everything, everything I've been fed for decades, it's a lie. And this is a guy is senior. We're not talking about just a journalist. And no. today he's changed his uh, approach? He has changed his approach, but he's too scared to come out because there is consequences. Mm -hmm. There is a price you pay. There is a price you pay. And you paid a price. I paid a price, and, yes. And yeah. one of the things that we're trying to do at the Jerusalem Center mm -hmm. for Public Affairs is take a revolutionary turn mm -hmm. towards a completely new communications concept um, in which we have tens mm -hmm. of women and men in the Arab world, in the Kurdish world, mm -hmm. in the... Sunni, Shia, uh, Iranian mm -hmm. world, in Arabic and in Farsi. How important, in your view, as a longtime veteran journalist, 
is this new approach of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, which is a diplomacy, national security, and communication center, towards bringing the Arab voices and the Farsi voices and Kurdish voices, um, sincere, legitimate voices from the region, in order perhaps to change the whole way that narratives are expressed throughout the region. It's extremely important. And, you know, we, we started this in interview saying that الشرق الأوسط لنا كلنا. You know, الشرق الأوسط is it's not for, for you or for me. It's for everyone, you know. Middle East. For the Middle East, yeah. We all live here. You know, this is this is our home. No one is leaving. And what you doing, I think it's amazing because you're bringing people together, you know. Uh, I personally think that most people, they would they would welcome this idea. Like, you know, one big family. But, um, I mean, don't blame them. These people have been fed decades in media that pour out the most horrible, you know, propaganda, uh, incitement, you know. So what you you doing and thinking to do, I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. It's amazing because you are not only giving your, you know, getting your story across, but you inviting others, you know, to be part, to share their story, to share their feelings. Yeah. It's really, it's very important. It's very important. It's not an easy battle because we're talking about media that has been established for decades. Uh, but it will, it will. You know, who ever thought, who thought that there will be a day, you know, you have Bahrain and Emirat, you know, and Morocco and Israel sitting on the same table. I'm sure you've been, you've been to Dubai. Did you ever Dubai. thought that one day you will go to Dubai? How was that? I, I never imagined, and I, and I just came back from Bahrain, and I never imagined I could walk through the streets of Bahrain with a kippah on mm -hmm. and be welcomed. Mm -hmm. as. And this is the idea of our Middle East, mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, the Jews, as you and I know, are indigenous, ancient mm -hmm. people. We've been here for 35, 3,600 years as a people, and the Kurds, mm -hmm. as much if not more, and the idea was to say, this is our family's region. Mm -hmm. We all have thousands of years uh, in the, uh, well, certainly we do. I mean, the the uh, the Arabs of Islam are 15, 1600 years old. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's it's an ancient region with ancient peoples and, and many, many hundreds of millions of minorities mm -hmm. uh, in the region. So uh, we wanted to say it's all of our Middle East. Yeah. And in a way, we are all part of the Middle Eastern family. And that's what we wanted to do with the JCPA, which hopefully soon will become the JCF, the, the Jerusalem Center for Foreign Affairs, because we're we're embracing mm -hmm. all peoples in the region uh, together as indigenous. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one great uh, one great experiment. It's wonderful to have you here to hear your perspective. No, thank you so much for inviting me and giving me the chance. Thank yeah, you. This is Suzanne Kutaz, uh, a, a Iraqi Kurd. Uh, having grown up in Sweden and living in the UK with a great, deep and, and broad perspective on all things Middle East. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective in Al Shak Al Asat Lana Ma'an. Together, our Middle East. Inshallah. So, inshallah. inshallah. Good to see you and I look forward to many more opportunities to have these types of chats. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.